Welcome to the Deep End Beyond Deck, a podcast where visionary builders, creators, and experts discuss world-changing ideas. I'm your host, Marshall Kosloff. Let's dive in. With the Deep End, we're creating space where we skip the surface level and go in-depth into ideas that matter. I'll be your guide as we explore possible futures of commerce, higher education, art, governance, longevity, and more with some of the most exciting figures in their respective fields. Joining me in the deep end for the second of this week's deep shorts is Rebecca Caden, a managing partner at Union Square Ventures. Rebecca sat down with me for a live recording during a recent on-deck New York City drop. USV is a legendary firm known for its investments in household names like Tumblr, Etsy, Twitter, Duolingo, and Coinbase. But I was most excited to chat with Rebecca about its thesis-driven approach to investing in startups. Their theses, the latest being Thesis 3.0, tell the story of the last 10 to 15 years of early stage investing and also the internet. By understanding how USV developed their point of view, it allows us to look deeper into the future. Two quick announcements for fans of the deep end before we dive into the conversation. Last week, we launched our Substack where we share notes from our episodes, links to further reading, and other announcements. The URL is thedeepend.substack.com. We'll also link to it in the show notes. We're doing our next live podcast recording on July 12th, this time with Packy McCormick, an ODF2 fellow and writer of the popular newsletter, Not Boring. If you want to attend the recording, you can request an invite via the Deep End substack. The Deep End is produced by On Deck, where top talent goes to accelerate their ideas and careers. We hope that those who listen to the ideas on the show are inspired to build. To learn more about On Deck's programs, visit beyonddeck.com. For show notes and additional resources related to the deep end, check out ideas.beyonddeck.com. All right, let's dive in. Marshall here again for one last note. We had a slight audio issue at the start of this interview, so we're going to drive straight into Rebecca describing what thesis-driven investing is. Here's Rebecca. If you think about investing, there's a lot of ways to kind of divvy it up and, and to go about it, and, and I think many good ways to do it. Um, there's a generalist form of investing. There's a coverage form of investing. That's probably the most common, right, where the idea is, can you see as many possible investments as you, know, as you can? And the implied nature of that is you're kind of doing comparative analysis along the way. We won't say that, but that's effectively what it is. And you're trying to figure out kind of quote unquote what the best ones to invest in are. We take a little bit of a different approach and we say we're going to be a thesis driven firm. So we're going to spend a lot of time um, thinking about what we believe in, what hypotheses we have, uh, what shared belief we can put forward about where a market or markets are going um, that number one just excites us and that we personally find interesting. That's a big kind of cultural ethos of USV. Um, We're a small partnership and we believe we should be all spending time on things that we're interested in and that excite us. Um, And then the second, can we push that further and say, you know, what stake in the sand can we have? What can we say? Well, we think this is going to happen. We think this is where things are going and this is where an opportunity is. Um, That often is a shared belief at a somewhat high level and then has many applications to it. So that underneath it, and I know we're going to talk about some of the, you know, the different theses we've had over time because it's definitely an evolution of them, but it has different applications and each partner may be slightly more interested in one application than another, but there's kind of a shared and cohesive strategy to it. Um, That does a few things for us. Um, It gives us kind of focus and structure. Uh, It helps us, especially in the more hectic a market is, the more it helps us because it focuses us in. We know what we want to do. We also know what we don't want to do. There's a lot of times where we can say, this could be a really good business. It's just not the right business for us. And that's really helpful, especially when there's a lot going on. And we think it also allows us to have different conversations with entrepreneurs and and founding teams because we're coming from a place of perspective uh, where we want to hear your perspective on what you're building. And we also want to dialogue and share our perspective and see where the alignment is. So um, all of those equate to to this thesis-driven approach. 
How organic is this process? Like, I, I assume there wasn't a moment where you all sat down and said, okay, hey, let's just write this out like it's a college paper. Right. You probably were doing things and those things trended in a direction because there's a team, there's a direction. Like, how does that process actually look like? Yeah, it's, it's very, very organic. USV kind of rejects structure by nature. Um, we have very few processes or rules um, involved. It's That's kind of a, you know, just who the people are. Um, so it's, it's very organic. What's not organic and that we are structured about is we set aside time to spend time as a team talking about ideas. So, you know, every venture fund has investment team meetings. We have those two. Uh, for us, they happen uh, one long, one a week, and one short, one a week. But we also have structured time on a regular basis where we're talking about ideas. And generally, someone comes and says, hey, I've been thinking about this. Um, and I'm just going to you know, throw an email up there or maybe a few slides or maybe nothing at all and we're gonna debate it and talk about it and it's not a deal, it's not a company, it's just ideas. And that helps push our thinking forward to a place where it evolves over time. For instance, um, we now manage three pools of capital, a core fund, an opportunity fund, and a climate and sustainability focused fund. And the climate and sustainability focused fund really came out of that using a couple of those sessions where one of my partners in particular said, I'm really thinking about this. I'm really thinking about this. And we push it forward and we debate it and we push it forward and eventually someone writes it into the blog post and we decide to do it. So it's, it's organic and structured at the same time. Yeah, so this is a good time to walk through thesis 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 because what's so interesting about the way that you wrote the blog post that everyone should also check out is it kind of tells the story of the last 10 to 15 years of investing, but also really just the internet. So let's start with 1.0. What was the idea there? Yeah, and, and um, I always like to be the one to talk about it, but also clear that you know, I joined the USB partnership four years ago. So I'm talking about things that um, wildly predate me, but also create kind of the history of the firm, which I think is really cool. Um, so when the firm was started, the original thesis was about large networks of engaged users. Now, in 2021, that feels like about as obvious as a thesis as you could get. We all know that network effects drive enormous amount of value. At that point, 2004, it, it was less so. Um, and the bet was that um, bottom-up solutions on either the consumer or on the enterprise side that create networks were going to drive a lot of value and be the best moat creator. That that was how you created defensibility because uh, when you tipped into a network, it was self-propelling and it was hard to break. Um, that proved to be correct um, and led to a lot of really interesting investments in Thesis 1.0, Twitter, Indeed, Etsy, things like that. Um, and as the firm continued, Thesis 2.0 is a direct evolution of Thesis 1.0, which is how that same belief extends to vertical networks in addition to horizontal, right? How can you think about network effects as applied to financial services or education or healthcare, and then this underlying infrastructure layer underneath the network. So if as all these networks were developing, they needed shared tools that created leverage and allowed them to scale. And that led to things like Twilio and Cloudflare and Stripe, right, this underlying level. That continued for a while. And, and like anything else, by the time we write and articulate a thesis into the world, and I think this was basically what you were saying, We've already been doing it. It just feels time to articulate it in a clear way. So it's, it is this kind of back and forth process. Um, the decentralized internet is also part of Thesis 2.0, which we can go into, but um, has to do with our crypto strategy there as well, which is a direct result of the networks as data aggregates what is going to be the kind of counteracting force to unlock more innovation and decentralize the internet. Um, and there you get blockchain and crypto. In 1.0 and 2.0, we could hear a bunch of hits. Like, what were some misses you think that came out of that? Ooh, love this question. So many misses. Um, yeah, so obviously the names we all remember are the ones that did well. Um, there's lots of misses involved. Um, some of my favorites. Um, the original Turntable FM, network effect related to music. I don't know if any of you guys loved that product briefly in a moment of time, but it was so cool. And then... It totally died because licensing's horrible and it's really hard to do, but they're back trying actually to do it again. Uh, several attempts at the idea of reinventing the address book and contacts were in there that didn't work. Um, a, a classic attempt at a network that forever people will try and no one has really cracked yet. Um, those are some that are on the top of my head, but many more. I don't want to get sidetracked, but like what 
what is reinventing the address book? It's because it seems so straightforward. I mean, my iPhone does a pretty good job of my iPhone, Twitter. No, it's crazy. Okay, this is the address book is crazy. You have someone in there with a number. You have my number. Your friend needs my number, but there isn't a shared contact database on the web, right? Like, there, if you update your number, it doesn't update in my phone. If you update, if you move, it doesn't change. Like, the fact that all of these things are static and not, not dynamic still is a little bit wild, but changing the behavior on something so basic to how we operate, as we all know, is extremely difficult. So there's been many, many attempts at this, and there still are, and there are probably some out there right now that are actually really cool and, and might work, but um, there are at least two in USB's history I can think of that were tried that didn't work. So that takes us to 3.0, and I'm just curious, as you're thinking about one, two, three, it's not as if things from one or two are ever just done, right? So no. blockchain, Descent, there's lots of plenty of Not stuff done. there still. Not done, right? So how do you think about that going into three? Yeah, these are all building on each other. We do not look at these as um, discrete theses where it's like, now we are done investing in network effects. No, in fact, that's still the underlying building blocks. They're all building on each other. Thesis 3.0 is predicated on thesis 1 and 2.0. Really what happened is when I... Um, I was joining at around the same time as the conversations around Thesis 3.0 were happening, though we weren't calling it at that time, they were just conversations. And we were really talking about, if you think about horizontal networks, vertical networks, and the underlying infrastructure, which is kind of those building blocks we've spoken about, you're really talking about an architecture of the web, right? And an architecture of our digital lives. And so what we were talking about is what does that allow for? What can you build on top of that now that those pieces are in place? And what do we want to be built on top of that? And already education was a big part of the USV portfolio. Financial services was a big part of the USV portfolio. But where our heads went is um, this is the opportunity to broaden access, right? You can, the real golden opportunity is that you can leverage technology to do things you can do with, that, that you can't do without technology, right? So where can you use these networks and platforms and protocols to drive up value and down cost in systematic ways, either on the consumer or on the enterprise side? And that's the basis of Thesis 3.0. There are sectors we specifically want to apply that to, but overall it's how do you leverage what's been built in, in Thesis 1 and 2.0 to broaden access on top of it. So in one of those sectors is education, which I'm super excited to talk about here because there's been a year where I feel like so many different preset ideas, companies, everything were just thrown right into, you know, the deep end, yeah. you know, so <laughs> what, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, education is one of the sectors that's um, been exciting to USV for a long time and, and obviously in the last 18 or 24 months in particular. The basic thinking of education for us is that there are very few things in our lives that haven't been structurally transformed by technology. And yet, overall, how we learn today looks almost identical to how we learned 50 years ago, maybe 100 years ago. Um, but what we know is that a one-size-fits-all model doesn't work in so many areas of our lives. And one of our education founders always says that school makes people feel like they're not made for school when really school's not made for them and that technology can be a way to, to really solve that. And we don't only mean that in you know, K-12 and childhood, but in you know, um, continuing education, lifelong education, we've really covered this stack there. Um, and, and the traditional ways have been really expensive. So there are alternatives to the kind of one-size-fits-all model of school, but they're very hard to obtain because of the price point. There's also other structural difficulties, geography, size of class, all these kind of things that are kind of structural to education. Technology is the break for all of that if you can have the products and services associated with it. And this is something that's not, you know, we'd been investing in for a while. If you think about Duolingo, uh, Quizlet, Skillshare, Code Academy, this is themed direct to learner education. We don't do things that are selling through school systems. We believe you go direct to the learner with a very good value proposition that broadens that access and it, and it should work. Um, you know, out school, which is live online classes for kids at dramatically accessible price points. So then comes along the pandemic. Those companies actually were all pretty good before, but the pandemic is a jump step in behavior because you know, necessity is the key to the change in behavior and the block of something as structural as education is we're really used to the norm and diverging from it as in something as core to us as education is hard to do. 
but now we have to diverge from it. And so I think it just catapulted behavior forward um, so extremely. And, and you know, the bet you have to make now is not will that stick. We all know it will stick. It's how much of it will, right? Like what discount do you give it? Um, but we're pretty bullish on that. Why don't you sell or why aren't you focused on companies that sell directly to school districts? Because I'm just imagining the past year of terrible Zoom school. If you could have had a product that said, hey, we'll make Zoom school like 5% better for your students, that would have been a huge market. So why, why don't you think of that that way? You would think that would be a huge market. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to sell to a school district or system. Anyone? Yeah. Okay. You know why you don't sell to school districts or systems. Yeah, it's really, really hard to do. It's extremely slow. I think it's one of those ecosystems where um, to break it, you have to go around it. And we don't want to break it. There's a great place for school systems in, in America, but to offer the alternatives, you have to go direct. Or you don't have to. We think the more efficient and bigger way is to go direct to the learner and that that signal that it's something that the learner can and will pay for is a very good signal of product market fit. It's real helpful. So can you talk about the two other areas? So one is there's like access to capital, um, which is obviously like super interesting, fits a bit into the 2.0 part, but what's the approach or thought there? Yeah, so our thinking on access to capital is not all that different than our access to knowledge. And, and by the way, in knowledge, we think about education, but we also think about how knowledge is shared and transmitted and networks of learning and information. Um, so it, it's broader than just education in that application. But so access to capital, we purposefully call that because we mean um, financial services. And, and you know, financial services, very similar to education, is structurally built really to serve the rich. Um, it always has been. Um, it's you know, a heavy offline services driven people organization. And so it serves the people with the money. Um, technology is an unlock to completely change that and to productize things that can make products and services that used to be accessible to few, accessible to many. We are now seeing that obviously in many different iterations, but there's more to come. You know, Neobanks is one example, but there's a lot to be done on access to credit and how credit is calculated and what that means. Um, access to financial services around the world, not only in the US, um, a lot of things there. And anyone who's built a financial services company knows you go down that road on the consumer side and you also learn how much of the rails underneath it need to be improved and how much opportunity there is on the enterprise side as well because it, it, all the systems are for the taking. And so we've really done things on both. The other side of access to capital is new forms of financial systems, which is where you get crypto. Um, and so we're also interested in you know, how people are gonna think about their financial health and um, investing and moving money around outside of the current system and what new ones could create. So we, we do both there. Something that you've discussed within this thesis is this idea of like creating like trusted brands and how important that is. And if we're talking about access to capital, that just instantly brings to mind everything that Robinhood went through. You could have a brand that people use, it's differentiated, and something can just happen and the situation can be complicated, but you could just lose trust that quickly in a space where you really need it. So how how do you think zooming out companies, investors, et cetera, how should they think about that idea of trust at a time when people are just really quick? to just flip. Yeah, and I mean, the Robinhood example is complicated because all of that's true and a lot of trust was lost, but Robinhood still is doing pretty well, right? And recovered pretty quickly. And so there's this you know, kind of macro question there. I mean, the reason we care so much about trusted brands is because when you're thinking about mass behavior change, it requires a lot of trust in the new thing um, to adopt something that um, isn't the norm. It requires a lot of trust. And then over time, it becomes obvious, right? So in financial services, we always talk about, remember when it was really crazy to auth your bank account? We're all like, I'm gonna give my password to my bank account to you know, this company, that's so crazy. And now you know, many of us do that on an extremely frequent basis. Plaid's made it so we do it and don't even realize it a lot. Like, you know, it, that's become pretty commonplace and, and, and we trust it, right? It's become trusted, but creating that trust is really hard, but often comes with a lot of reward once you do. Um, so we think the, the leaders are going to be able to pioneer and create that trust. You know, we talk about it a lot in financial services. I actually think education and healthcare are as important to do that in as financial services. And then the final sector is well-being, which is interesting because it's, it's not just like health and healthcare, which is obvious, but it's also community in that part. So I'd love to break up those two and 
Or yeah, maybe they're not even broken up. No, I mean, even since we've published that thesis, I think this idea of mental health being part of well-being is, um, and healthcare is now much more part of the common dialogue than it was when we published it. And certainly the you know, investment and growth in that space shows it. Um, but yeah, we think about well-being as, as you know, access to healthcare, and, and we've done some things there, um, particularly around how can healthcare flip from being reactive to proactive and, and things like that, but also this idea of well-being. And uh, I've been obsessed with this idea that I think we've created a lot of networks online, but networks and community are different things. Um, networks connect us all to each other. Community creates belonging. And I'm not sure that that's been built yet, really, or it may just be starting to be built, but that the first era of kind of social networks was not about community and belonging. It was really about networks. Um, and so, you know, I wrote a, a post called Come for the Action, Stay for the Community, but we've explored ideas that What's really going to build community is something more verticalized, things where you have a buy-in of sorts, and then the community is built on top of it. Um, so those are things that are really interesting to us. Are there things in the crypto space that can make that work a little better? Yeah, I mean, you know, when you talk about that in the crypto space, what you're saying is like we're going from crypto infrastructure, which is where a lot of the kind of focus has been to application layer of crypto. And you're seeing that now with NFTs for sure, and communities built on, you know, we're investors in Dapper, which is NBA Top Shot, and there's a lot of community built around that and things like that. But I think we're pretty early on what community, I mean, there's definitely a rich crypto community, but in a structured way, it's pretty early, I think. So a good place to really culminate with a bit of like usefulness is how would you, I'm really just into the idea in this conversation of people coming up with their own like personal theses about whether these I want you have to correct me after the fact um, about either their company or the space they're in. Like, how should people go about thinking and putting their experiences? Especially, probably, I can think of a million things I thought about and learned over the past year. How should people think about that? Yeah, I mean, anyone who starts a company has a thesis, right? Like that's by design what you have to have to go for it and do it. You're saying to the world, look, I think this should exist and here's why. Um, but you know, articulating theses, what I would say is you start with something, what do you care about? What do you think about? What do you, what do you believe? I think a lot of people get hung up on this idea that, well, what if other people believe it too, right? Is my idea, is my thinking unique enough? You know, do other people have the same thoughts? And I would encourage you to throw away that. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Push that out of your mind and, and keep, keep going. And then push what you're thinking further. Um, and this is why I love partnership and collaboration, because often they're what push my thinking further, right? But um, if you take what you believe and take, you know, and then what? And then what? You know, what if that's true? What if that's true? I think that's how you really develop a thesis. And to keep in mind, you know, financial opportunity and financial service isn't a thesis. That's a category. Um, to really develop a thesis, you have to say, I think this is going to happen, and here's why. And that takes a lot of you know, pushing and courage. And I think also, I think one thing about my partners that I've really learned is free willingness to be wrong. Think in public, publish ideas when they're half-baked and, you know, be very open to being publicly wrong. Um, and that helps you and it helps everyone else around you. And developing that comfort level, I think, is is really important. And I think the, the last big thing basically is, and I hinted at this at the start of the conversation, Looking back on the 3.0 thesis, are there any edits you would make based on the past year? Mm, what a good question. I think the past year for, uh, for us just dramatically accelerated the timeline of it. If you think about um, how to leverage these platforms and protocols and networks to broaden access to you know, knowledge, capital, and well-being, the comfort level with interacting with products and services in those categories in a mass way is dramatically different today than it was 18 months ago. And so in many ways, the opportunity is just nearer. Um, you can take as a given some amount of behavior that you couldn't before and push that even farther. So I don't know that that would edit it, um, but I, I think it accelerates it. And a good example was your point about like mental health, well-being, that was just, that's much clearer. It doesn't have to be explained to the degree you probably would have had to before. Yeah, or I mean, the, the mass resistance to seeing doctors, you know, we had video networks of, of healthcare, but that was about it. There's a lot, people were very, very resistant to doing in healthcare uh, virtually. The comfort level now versus then is dramatically different. Um, and, and 
that's great for the businesses that exist, but it also unlocks new opportunity to build on top of it. And that's what we're always focused on. Okay, if you take for a given now what you couldn't before, what else can you do? What's next besides that? And so we're just pushing ourselves faster than we would otherwise to think, okay, what's next on top of this? Wow, that's great. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us in the deep end. If you enjoyed your stay, give us a review on Apple Podcasts and share this episode with your friends and colleagues to help grow the show with us. We've also got show notes and more episodes available at ideas.beyonddeck.com. See you next time.